busy. Um, so I would just like to say welcome to the first installment of the International Geosynthetic Society's North American Chapters 2022 webinar series. Um, I'm Kristen Sample Lord. I am a board member of the North American Chapter and I'll be your host for today. So first a little bit about the IGS North American Chapter. Our mission is to provide leadership in advancing geosynthetics education and research to attain their appropriate and widespread use as engineering materials. The leadership within this nonprofit organization is completely volunteer, so we could not provide this content to you without the support of companies like Geosyntech Consultants. Um, so if you could please change to the next slide. Geosyntech Consultants is a pioneering engineering design firm in the waste containment industry. Starting in 1980, their engineers and scientists have led the way in waste containment design. Over the past four decades, they've authored the US EPA's guidance on seismic design for MSW structures, co-authored technical guidance for RECLA and CERCLA, final closure systems, and are established leaders on containment design for PFAS and emerging contaminants. Geosyntech Consultants company culture revolves around education and continued learning and giving back to the industry through sponsorship <clears throat> such as the International Geosynthetic Society Foundation, and student scholarships at various universities and this webinar. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so today um, we welcome Professor Rowe and Professor Benson. Neither of these gentlemen need a formal introduction. I believe everyone on today's webinar is aware of the contributions these two have made to the advances and practices in the waste containment industry and other segments of the geotechnical engineering field. On behalf of IGS North America, I cannot express how proud we are to have both of these gentlemen speaking to all of you at the same time. Today, Professors Rowe and Benson will lead an online discussion with short presentations and lots of opportunity for audience participation. But please note, we're going to address questions submitted through the Q&A box on the Zoom screen, so don't submit your questions through the chat function during the presentation. Questions are being monitored by our presenters and they'll be addressed as they come in. <clears throat> Continuing education certificates will be emailed directly to those that attend within a week from today. And on behalf <clears throat> of Geosyntech Consultants, IGS North America, and our attendees, we welcome Professors Rowan Benson, and the floor is yours. Thanks, Kristen. It's good to be here, and I, I thank you for everybody for attending. Um, um, and thanks for the kind words. You're very uh, generous with your thoughts about both Carrie and I. Um, this is structured not to be a lecture. We want to make this more of a discussion. My role today is going to be as a discussion facilitator, and Carrie Rowe's role will be as the presenter. Uh, we're going to structure this in a way with some early content about PFAS compounds. If people all over the country, all over the world right now are talking about PFAS compounds, their impact on health, how we're gonna manage them in the environment. There's a whole plethora of unanswered questions, but we'll begin with talking about what are these compounds? So we all start on that same page. And then we're gonna to begin to talk through three kind of overarching issues for containment systems that are directly relevant to people in IGS. Uh, and we're gonna stop as we go through and talk through questions to try to make this more of an interactive experience as opposed to a lecture. What I would like to ask each of you to do as we're going through and you have questions that come up, add them in the q and I'm going to continue to can you continuously read them as we go through. Uh, and I, uh, as we get to different stopping points, uh, I will pose those questions to Carrie and we'll have a discussion. Uh, so please uh, think about your questions and add them right into the Q&A bo uh, box. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Carrie Rowe, Carrie. Thanks very much, uh, Kristen and Craig, and for your kind comments, Kristen. I'd like to begin by acknowledging uh, a number of people who've made a very significant contribution to what I'll be presenting today, and they are listed on this slide. I'd also like to recognize that the research I'm going to be talking about couldn't be done without financial support. And I thank the three groups listed on this slide who have provided the support for us to do the research I will be discussing. So now we come to PFAS, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. 
It's quite a mouthful and it covers over 4,700 different compounds, which we probably never heard of until a few years ago, but we've been dealing with in our consumer products for a long time. They've also been widely used in training for firefighting and fire response sites, airports, industrial <coughs> sites. And because they're ubiquitous, they're ending up in wastewater and in landfill leachate. And indeed, they're being found in the blood of polar bears in the Arctic and 98 to 99% of Americans. So what are they? They typically will have a backbone or tail that involves carbon atoms with fluorine attached to it. So here we see perfluorooctane sulfonate and perfluorooctane carboxylate, PFOS and PFOA. You'll see they both have eight carbon atoms with fluorine attached, and that is the tail, which is hydrophobic or lithophilic, which means it doesn't like water, but it likes fats and oils. But then it has a head, in one case, the SO3 group, the other case, CO2, which is hydrophilic. It likes water. And these compounds fit into a general class we call surfactants. And surfactants we most commonly know as soap. So soap allows us to wash grease off our hands in water. They'll mix with oil and water in simple terms. Now they're very, very useful compounds. That's why they're so ubiquitous. But the problem is the now known or suspected health effects. I'm not gonna go through this list, but you can see it's pretty significant. Now we've been doing testing on quite a few different PFAS. I'm gonna highlight a few of them for you. Two you've already met, PFOA and PFOS, and they have eight carbon atoms with fluorine and a different head. Then we come to PFBS, which is a butene core, which has got four carbon atoms with fluorine hanging off, but otherwise looks pretty similar to PFOS. Then we come to 6,2-FTS. It has six carbon atoms with fluorine plus two carbon atoms with hydrogen as the attached atom. And then the sulfonate group at the end. Then we have 7,3-FTCA, which has seven carbon atoms with fluorine and three carbon atoms without the fluorine. Now, because of the problems with some of these PFAS, other chemicals are being developed to replace them. For example, a product called Gen X is a replacement for PFOA. And so we're interested in looking at how these chemicals also behave. This brings us to the outstanding questions we'll be discussing today. And the first of those is how readily will PFAS diffuse through GCLs and geomembranes, our two most common lining materials. The second is what is the potential for PFAS impacting groundwater when contained in municipal solid waste landfills? The third is how will PFAS affect the longevity of geomembranes? So let us begin with the first of these questions. How readily will PFAS diffuse through GCLs? We're going to use chloride as our reference. So we'll take chloride diffusing through a GCL at a low stress of 20 kilopascals, and we're going to put the other diffusion coefficients relative to that. So PFOA diffuses at about 17% of the rate of chloride and PFOS at about 7%. So that's good news. They're diffusing much slower than chloride. It gets better as we increase the stress. With higher stress, there's higher tortuosity and it's more difficult for diffusion. And chloride drops to 45% of the value at 20 kPa. We see PFOA drops to 10% of the chloride at 20 kPa and PFOS at 6%. 
And so there is an advantage in the sense that they diffuse slower, but they still diffuse. I want to emphasize that these are preliminary. These tests take a lot of time. We don't publish until we're confident of the data, but we'll be publishing these in the not too distant future. Next question is how do they diffuse through geomembranes? We're looking at a number of different geomembranes. For reasons I haven't time to go into, we're looking at relatively thin materials. We've got thermoplastic polyurethane. We've got linear low density polyethylene, high density polyethylene, and three PVCs with different formulations to see how that affects PVC1, PVC2, PVC3. And we've got two co-extruded geomembranes with LLVP EVOH. They've been proven to be very good for hydrocarbons. So the question is, how good are they for these particular contaminants in PFAS? Well, to take a reference, we have known for some time that polyethylene will allow the diffusion of benzene and ethyl benzene. So how do they perform compared to that? And the answer for the co-extruded is extremely well, up to 3 million times lower permeation coefficient for PFAS or PFOA than for benzene, and even bigger difference for ethyl benzene compared to them diffusing through LLVPE. But also very good performance are PVC1 and PVC2 and HDPE. These can be all classified as outstanding. They are really, really good diffusion barriers to PFOA and PFOS. LLDPE is still excellent, but not quite as good. And TPU is very good. It's in the same class as phenol diffusing through HDPE, but nowhere near as good as the others. Again, I caution that these are preliminary. These tests take years to run, and that's why you see the less than or equal signs. Those numbers will get smaller the more data we get. But what do these numbers really mean in terms of potential impact in a landfill? So let's look at a specific case and do some calculations. So we'll take a landfill cell with an average of 25 meters of municipal solid waste, an operating leachate collection system and 0.3 meters of head, an infiltration of about 15 centimeters per annum through the cover. And we're gonna take the highest reported concentration of PFOS in landfill leachate. So that's a conservative number to use. And we're going to look at a barrier system that's comprised of a 1.5 millimeter thick HTPE combined with seven millimeter thick GCL after compression under the weight of the waste. That is underlain by a 3.75 meter thick attenuation layer and a three meter thick lacquer aquifer. So we don't have very much hydrogeologic protection in this case. And what do we find? If there are no holes in an HDPE gem membrane, zero leakage, then the calculated impact is about eight nanograms per liter. That's compared to 4,800 in the landfill at its peak. And so there's a lot of reduction, very effective as a diffusion coefficient. But let's put that in context. If we look at a number of jurisdictions, and I picked eight here, a number of US states, Australia, Ontario, and Canada, as well as Europe. And we find that in all of these jurisdictions, we would meet the requirements, although only just in Michigan. And there is a very big caveat here. To meet that requirement in Michigan, the geomembrane has to last for 425 years before it is no longer needed. And so that raises the third question we'll look at today. How long will the geomembrane last? 
So what are our preliminary conclusions here? The diffusion coefficient and sorption through GCLs can be established at the required stress level. And values for PFAR and PFOS are to be published in the next year or so, with more to come shortly thereafter. Data is now being published diffusion through geomembranes. And what we've found is that the co-extruded EVOH, HTPE, and special PPCs all do an excellent job as a diffusion barrier. Now, once you know the contaminants that you're taking into consideration and have diffusion coefficients through the different materials, you can then model them with a computer program such as POLU to estimate the concentrations you will expect in a receptor aquifer over time. So that brings us to the end of the first segment. Let's now talk about the first question. Over to you, Craig. Our audience is a bit shy so far, Carrie. We don't have any questions in the Q&A, but, but I have one for you. Um, you know, we have a plethora of different PFAS compounds, hundreds if not thousands from the different manufacturing techniques. We have short chain compounds, long chain compounds, different types of heads on, and on, on different types of tails. And yet in our laboratory work, we can only take a segment of what of that class of compounds and evaluate them. Uh, are there ways that we can take the information that we're gathering from information like you showed here today and extrapolate them to other types of compounds? Is there a way to do that? To some extent, um, I mean, this is not a new problem. We've faced this with landfill leachate with thousands of compounds before. Yeah. And the typical strategy is, and Part of the strategy we've adopted here in choosing the ones we're looking at is you look at the ratio of the concentration in the leachate or whatever the source is you're interested in. But in this context, we're talking about landfill leachate to what it's allowed in groundwater. And the higher that ratio, all other things being equal, the more important it's likely to be as a contaminant that's going to cause impact. Then you can look at the different classes, as you said. Um, PFAR and PFOS have different heads to them. So how does that affect the performance uh, is one important factor. The length of the chain is another important factor. So looking at all of these factors, um, one can make an assessment and pick some representative compounds in different groups uh, to try and make predictions. And if you have another compound that's a lower concentration, but you haven't tested it, but it's very similar to one you have tested, it's reasonable to use um, the one you tested as a, a proxy. Can I go one, one step further um, on that question? So to extend beyond extrapolating for different compounds, what about extrapolating between different GCL products? How much of a difference do you think that would make? Uh, it certainly can make a difference. Um, there are many different GCLs and they're not all equal. Uh, we are testing a couple of GCLs and certainly our results are very representative of that. The best part of the answer to the question is if they're all designed and used properly, then as long as they've got somewhat similar mass per unit area of bentonite, they will tend to perform well. Where we really see the big difference between different GCL products is when they are subjected to extreme conditions. Um, then the differences show up very, very clearly. And both Craig's work and our work has shown there can be four, five orders of magnitude difference in performance. But if we're talking about bottom liners here where it's properly designed, properly installed, then I don't expect, expect such a massive difference. And I think the diffusion coefficients will be fairly similar. Carrie, I'm going to take a follow on to that. We'll ask one, just one more question. Oh, actually, we got one from our group. I'm actually going to, uh, this is one from Boyd Ramsey. Thank you, Boyd. Uh, any data on granular versus powdered GCL performance? Do you see differences between those for PFAS transport? Uh, good question. As long as they're well hydrated, the answer is no. If they're not well hydrated, then there will be a difference. So it's, it's a question of how well hydrated they are. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on that, Carrie. Exactly. W one follow on to that, um, you know, with, with GCLs, you know, one concern we have is with chemical interactions that may alter the propensity to swell and hydrate. Do PFAS compounds influence that to any significant degree? We are not seeing a significant effect on that. Uh, we're doing tests with PFAS in municipal solid waste or simulated municipal solid waste leachate. And the predominant effect on K is going to be due to the municipal solid waste leachate. The PFAS is still at a relatively small level and um, it doesn't seem to have much effect relative to what the um, municipal solid waste leachate, at least as far as we've gone and there's a long way to go in this research. That, that's very similar to what we're seeing as well. So good to hear that. All right, let's move on to the next section. Okay, so the next question we're going to address is, what is the potential for PFAS impacting groundwater when contained in municipal solid waste landfills? A moment ago, we looked at a cell where there was a geomembrane with no holes. We would love to see that, but the reality is that more often than not, you're going to have holes, even with good construction quality assurance. Five holes per hectare is a reasonable number. And with casual construction quality assurance, 20 or more holes per hectare can be expected. And the holes that are most important are the ones I'm showing on this slide, holes in wrinkles, because they allow the water to migrate and hence the leachate to migrate to considerable distance from the hole and cover a much larger area from which it can migrate through the GCL and the subsurface. So what is the probability that a hole will occur in a wrinkle? Well, that depends on the area that's below the wrinkles, which depends on the time of day you covered the geomembrane. If you cover it before about nine in the morning or after five in the evening, our research suggests you'd be about 5%. Now with five holes per hectare, there's a 23% probability you'll hit a wrinkle with a hole. 10, you go to 40%, and with 20 holes, you go to 62%. But if you didn't cover it when there are minimal wrinkles, you can get up to 30% of the area below wrinkles if you were to cover towards the middle of a sunny day, and that's in Canada. And you can see the probability of having a wrinkle with a hole increases very quickly. So let's look at wrinkles with a hole. Uh, the limiting case is none and no leakage. We're looking at 150 meter per hectare wrinkle with a hole, 100, 200, and 250. And we've got very good geomembrane GCL properties. And we see leakages going from zero to 53 liters per hectare per day, or in US units, zero to about six gallons per acre per day. Those are not large leakages. And the probability of exceeding this based on available data is 60%. So if you've got a single line of system, there's a 60% probability you'll exceed what I've got here. But let's see what you ha happens with this. These are the predicted impacts in that aquifer for the same landfill cell I looked at before, going from eight to 180. So let's compare that with our eight different jurisdictions. As we go from no holes, we satisfy conditions in eight to a hole in 50, meter long wrinkle, we're satisfying six. The wrinkle gets to 100 meters, we only satisfy five. It gets to 200 meters, we satisfy three. And at 300 meters, we satisfy only two, Texas and Canada are outside of Ontario and British Columbia. And there's a 60% probability that will exceed this. Now that was with very good geomembrane GCL properties. These are the same wrinkles, but more typical properties. And you see, we quickly go from two to zero jurisdictions in which we meet the requirements. Now, 
I included New York and Ontario in that comparison for a single liner. But in fact, they're likely to be okay because both require a double composite liner for landfills of the size I considered with an average of 25 meters of waste. Other jurisdictions, however, with a single line landfill of similar size to what we looked at have a potential problem. I emphasize the word potential because I assumed very little hydrogeologic protection. The more natural hydrogeologic protection you have, the better things will be. One can assess the potential risk on a case by case basis from analysis such as we described in a recent paper in computers and geotechnics. So once you know the contaminants you're dealing with, have diffusion coefficients through the different layers, you can estimate the leakage based on the probability of certain leakages for different designs and level of CQA. And then you can do computer modeling to estimate the concentrations that you expect in the aquifer over time. And so that brings us to the second discussion point. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, we have a question from Dylan Roberts that actually goes back to the earlier um, part of the presentation, but, but is relevant to this as well. Would you be able to provide an estimate for what fraction of landfills are represented by the conditions that you've used during testing or perhaps even in the uh, scenarios you've presented here? Is this common or less common? The conditions in which we're doing <clears throat> testing, I would say are relatively common. I've deliberately picked a case where I'm not relying on the hydrogeologic protection because that will vary enormously from site to site. So without knowing the particular site hydrogeology, uh, we don't know what the condition will be. It shouldn't be worse than what I predicted for the particular case I looked at, um, but it could be better. And that's why I used that word potentially impact in the previous conclusion. Yeah, I think you chose that very carefully and thoughtfully. Uh, here's a question from Scott Grays. Um, he asked if you could just say a little bit more about the model and the method that you used. I know you mentioned pollute uh, and the assumed aquifer characteristics. Um, and you indicated that they're conservative and he wanted to get a sense for just a little more detail on, on how you set that up to draw the inferences you've made. Well, conservative was used in the context that I've only got a fairly small thickness of attenuation layer before it gets to a three meter thick aquifer. And it's not a rapidly flowing aquifer. It's a fairly typical aquifer in Southern Ontario is what I modeled it on. <coughs> um, conservative is therefore in the context of that hydrogeologic protection. Uh, in terms of how to model it, uh, Polyute is a semi-analytic model. The challenge we face here with these problems is the difference in scale and time. We're dealing with interfaces between the geomembrane and GCL that are of the order of microns. And to be able to model that, we're dealing with geomembranes that may be one and a half, two millimeters thick, GCL seven millimeters thick. Then we've got the soil, which is the order of meters to tens of meters thick and dimensions of hundreds to a thousand or more meters. And that's not easily done with traditional numerical methods like fine element. So the beauty of a semi-analytic method is that allows you to get around some of these problems. Yeah, there certainly is complexity when some of the evaluations we've been doing, uh, for example, we have a thick veto zone and we've got unsaturated zone diffusion and that the diffusion coefficient is varying with depth, adds to the complexity and the scale issues as well. Yes, um, as soon as you get to unsaturated soil, it becomes more complicated still. Yeah, infinitely more. Uh, here's a question from Melissa. Uh, are the wrinkle percentages and times of day uh, only for black geomembranes? And, and might this be different if you are using a, a, a white uh, geomembrane to change the probability of the holes? Uh, yes, it will make a difference. Uh, a white geomembrane in our um, 
testing and field work is at the middle of the day, about 20 degrees <coughs> Celsius uh, than a black tumor membrane, which reduces the number of wrinkles. So you could redo those numbers in terms of a white tumor membrane. The probabilities get a bit smaller, but they're still pretty high. And here's another question from Boyd. Uh, do you see a disconnect between regulatory requirements where we're talking about water quality criteria in the single parts per trillion level uh, in some states uh, and in some jurisdictions in the very best composite liners that we have? Now, are, these, are these two congruent? You know, is this a practical problem to solve? I think it is. Um, what I was looking at was a single composite liner with very little hydrogeologic protection. What we're working on now is double line systems with the two composite liners, and they're going to perform substantially better um, than a single line system. And of course, it depends on what the regulatory limit is. I mean, you get to the point where it's ridiculous. Yeah. But I I'm also suspicious of some of these very low values. Uh, we do a lot of testing and know the level of variability there is, even in control samples that you send uh, to be analyzed. And so I think we need to be a little cautious of some of these very low, low limits in that I'm not sure that the testing methodology is truly able to, in theory, it gets it right, but you do a lot of tests on them and there's a lot more scatter than people will admit. The analytical uh, challenges are, are significant at that level. Uh, just kind of a related question. There's new products coming out, uh, GCLs and other types of geosynthetics that have the potential to absorb or bind PFAS compounds as a way of retarding the transport. Do you see that as a practical solution and a long-term solution? I think it's an interesting thing to look at. Um, I think for new facilities, of course, um, if it's proven that they are good in the long term, uh, they could be a potential source. Uh, I think a lot more research has to be done before we can really draw a conclusion as to how effective they will be. Uh, one of our big challenges, of course, is not the new sites, but all of the, the thousands and that's probably an underestimate of old sites that are going to have to be managed. Uh, I guess just one kind of uh, wrap up on this and then we'll move on. Uh, you know, we, we have in some states and, and, and jurisdictions, provinces, we have double line system for leak detection, right? Are we seeing PFAS compounds in leak detection systems? Are we seeing them in monitoring systems beneath liners in uh, modern engineered facilities? Is that type of information you're seeing? Well, that's it's a very good question. I haven't seen enough data yet to really draw any conclusion. Um, I'm not sure enough people are analyzing it, at least um, if they're analyzing it, I'm not getting to see the data. Uh, so uh, it's something that should be done and would be very useful if we can get that data. But again, you've got to get reliable data. Yeah, your thoughts on that are similar to mine. I think we'll see them if we look for them, right? And uh, historically, we just haven't, right? They haven't been on the things, the list of analytes we've considered. We had just one uh, short question, then we'll move on from Ji Ying Fang. I uh, just had a question about the, the holes and wrinkles and whether the holes that you assumed were in different wrinkles or in connected wrinkles. Any? Uh, I assume that wrinkle, but you've got, to, you've got to distinguish what you mean by one wrinkle. You can have multiple wrinkles that connect up, and I call that one wrinkle. And you get networks of wrinkles. So I assume they were in one network of wrinkles. But the overall effect wouldn't be all that different if it was multiple holes in adding up to the same amount. Great. Well, thanks, Carrie. Let's let's go on to the next next phase. Okay. So the last question we're going to look at is how will PFAS affect the longevity of geomembranes? Here we have to do a little background <coughs> on thermooxidative degradation of HDPE. We're plotting some property of interest versus time. 
the first property we're interested in is antioxidants, and they deplete with time during what we call stage one. Then there's a quiet time in stage two, and then the polymer itself starts to degrade in stage three. And nominal failure occurs when some property of particular interest drops to 50% of its representative value. Now, nominal failure is related to service life, but is not the same as service life. And the testing that we're doing is looking at nominal failure. A big difference between these two things is strain. So what does the, what, what factors affect how long the gene membrane lasts? Well, of course, there's the polymer and additive package itself. Then there's exposure to the elements and of particular interest to us today, the chemical composition of the fluid in contact with the geomembrane. Other important parameters are temperature, the nature of the exposure, sustained tensile strains, and seams or wells. Now we know that municipal colored waste has surfactants and we've known for a long time that a surfactant will accelerate the depletion of the antioxidants and hence reduce the length of stage one and the service life. PFAS are surfactants. So we shouldn't be surprised if PFAS accelerate antioxidant depletion. So let's look at some data and how we use it to predict how long it will be to antioxidant depletion. So these are immersion tests performed on one geomembrane with two years of data and at 65 degrees, which is a test temperature, we are predicting 3.6 years to deplete antioxidants in municipal solid waste leachate. Now, when we do a test with PFAS and added to the municipal solid waste leachate, that drops from 3.6 years to 2.3. And if we just put PFAS in the still water, we're at 4.1. So that gives us an idea that the chemistry does make a difference. Here is a plot of normalized OIT, which is a measure of the antioxidants versus time. And I want to draw your attention to the shape of the curve. You'll see that in the first year, we have very rapid depletion. In the second year, we have slower depletion. And as we approach the third year, we'll get even slower depletion, which means if you make prediction on one year's data, you're going to be very conservative in your estimate. With two years, you'll be less conservative, with three years, less still. But you need to run these tests for a period of time to get reliable data. So let's look at how the length you run the test, and these, we've been running tests for a number of years now, affects your prediction of the depletion time. So at 65, with one year of data, we predict 3.2 years. With two years of data, we predict 3.6. With three years of data, 3.9. So we can see we increased by 13% by getting an extra year's data and 22% with one more year's data. I do this to caution you that you need to be patient if you want to do these types of tests and get reliable results. The predictions improve and become less conservative with more aging time. So now let's go from the lab, but we translate the lab into what we predict will happen in the field. And from tests that we've done, both in immersion tests and in full scale, line of systems, we find a factor of about 3.4 difference. And so if we apply that and use the data I had before to predict what would be the time to normal depletion at 40 degrees C, which is a reasonable value for a municipal solid waste landfill. It could be more, it could be less, but it's, it's in the right ballpark. We predict 150 years with municipal solid waste leachate we add PFAS to it and that drops to 100. If we were to just look at PFAS and DUI water, that's 180. And so it's going to depend on the temperature, 
what that service life will be. And this, of course, is just the first stage of the service life, just stage one. This is not the service life itself, which will be longer when you add two and three. These are also preliminary. We haven't published them yet. We'll publish them when we feel we've got sufficient data to be confident. But what about stages two and three? My hypothesis is that PFAS will not affect stages two and three the way it has affected stage one. Am I right with my hypothesis? Our testing will tell us, but we probably have to wait another five to 10 years to be sure. So what can we conclude? For future landfills, potential effects of PFAS on geomembrane service life need to be evaluated. Preliminary evidence indicates that PFAS accelerate AO depletion, antioxidant depletion, but we've only considered here one geomembrane. We're considering more, but this is the one that led we have the most data for. And the effect will depend on the solution chemistry and the additive package in the geomembrane. Not all geomembranes will perform the same with a given solution. Also, the sensitivity to PFAS concentration needs to be studied. The use of a single composite liner for containing PFAS needs to be evaluated based on the expected leakage and surface life issues. So the topic was the good news and the bad. The good news, HDPE, special PVCs and co-extruded EVOH are excellent diffusive barriers to PFAS and PFOA. <coughs> and data will be coming on other compounds in the near future. The bad news, leakage through holes in geomembranes will control impact and single composite liners are probably not adequate based on field data for many applications. Double lined landfills are recommended for the future. PFAS appears to affect the service life of the geomembrane, but exactly how much remains to be established. So that brings us to the end of the three questions and any further discussion. Carrie, I have a question for you. At, at 40 degrees C, you showed 100 to 200 years, depending on the, so, the solution. What at 20 degrees C? Something that might be a ground temperature, or maybe 10 degrees C. Uh, the numbers go up almost exponentially with temperature and absolute zero. And so they will be substantially longer at 20 degrees and even longer at 10 degrees. So the issue is not so much what happens when you get to those temperatures, it's well, what the aging that happens while the landfill's hot. Okay. And we might have different types of facilities that uh, manage different types of waste, some that generate heat, others that do not. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, given that I was trying to present that in five and six minutes, <laughs> I restricted myself to one temperature. But yes, uh, as you know, from the data we've got, we can predict it at a whole wide range of temperatures. And if it was a facility that doesn't generate heat, uh, depending on where you were, if in Florida, it might be 10, 20 degrees C. Uh, in Canada, it'll be five to 10 degrees in southern Ontario, for example. So you've got to look at your particular environment, but the lower the temperature, the longer the service life. Do you think there might be an opportunity to think of scavenging type of compounds that you might add to the formulation that um, might ad address some potential antioxidant depletion issues? Well, I. I think it, a lot will depend on the particular antioxidant package that you use. And one of the items of interest is looking at geomembranes with different antioxidant packages. We know, for example, that if you're dealing with high pH or low pH solution, uh, you can have a geomembrane that's perfect at low pH, is very bad at high pH, and you can have one that's the opposite. All depends on the chemistry of the antioxidant package. And so, 
I presented results for one particular geomembrane. We need to look at more geomembranes with different antioxidant packages. And that goes, that's without getting to the question you have talked about, well, what else do you add? The caution I would add, if you start adding other things, you should really have to look at what are the unintended consequences. Um, it's worth looking at, but one shouldn't go charging ahead with that without a lot of good research. Yeah, that's the uh, always the challenge, what you didn't expect and whether yes. that's gonna come back and bite you. Um, yeah, I think for another point you made, which I think uh, is important as well, in a lot of applications we treat, I shouldn't say we, but often geosynthetic products get treated like commodities, a geomembrane, a GCL, but they're not commodities. They have distinct engineering characteristics. And one particular product may be better in one application and another product in a different application. And that uh, paying attention to the details about the product that you're using and how it's being used is particularly important. And, and I think in, in practice gets lost at times. Have you seen that or would, could you comment on that a little bit? Well, I, I'll comment to start with to say you're absolutely right. Um, one of the reasons I guess you and I get a lot of legal work is people don't pay enough attention to those things. And that a commodity geomembrane is good for a commodity application. But when you're looking at specialty applications where either you have a long service life needed you have temperatures that are elevated, or you have chemistry that is non-typical, uh, you really need to pick the products very carefully for the application, whether it's a geomembrane or a GCL or other products for that matter, but we're focusing here on geomembranes and GCL. As I said before, the antioxidant package and also the resin are very important. Their compatibility with the environment you're looking at. Uh, you may need a different resin for a high temperature application than a lower temperature application. Different antioxidants, depending on the chemical composition that you're dealing with. And with GCLs, uh, as you pointed out, uh, I know one manufacturer produces 50 different GCL products. There's a reason for that. Um, they serve different purposes in different applications. That really goes at engineering is what we're trying to do right not just applying but engineering to particular solutions um, exactly yeah. the, these facilities have to be properly engineered with a good understanding and the good news is that a lot of people are now paying more attention to this and actually doing tests because the only way to know if a geomembrane for example is suitable for a given environment chemical environment is to do some tests and see how it performs. There's no way of looking at the initial properties and predicting how it will perform in terms of long-term performance. Your initial stress crack resistance, your initial OIT numbers may represent better performance, but they may not. It all depends on the particular details and you can only tell by testing. And some of that uh, testing, takes very long periods of time. And I want to commend you, uh, Carrie, on, on, on being very patient and really uh, understanding these long-term tests and, and taking the time and effort to collect those type of data sets. We do that in our lab as well. And I know how complex and challenging that can be, but that's how we get at the right answers in the end. And we really understand the phenomena. Kristen, did you have a question? I didn't mean to talk over. Oh, no, you kind of answered it. I, I was just going to finish that off with, you know, what did you feel was the biggest hurdle for people to be doing these more project specific tests? It, you know, is it the time? Is it the complexity? And, and will we be at a point where there's enough data out there that maybe people can just use what's available? Would you sum up? Would you... <laughs> I'm sorry, I was just going to try and answer that question. Um, because we've been doing this for over 20 years now, we've got a pretty good database of how different products perform. And so that allows you, and we're doing this on quite often on projects now, to do testing over a shorter period of time and benchmark a product versus one you've tested for a much longer period of time. And that allows you, without actually having to wait for 
20 years. Uh, we recently published a paper on 18 years study, uh, three generations of PhD student. Uh, takes a lot of patience to do that. But we can use that sort of data to benchmark shorter term tests. And we've got quite a lot of data now that goes well over a decade on different, uh, particularly geomembrane products that we can use to benchmark the relative performance against. Thanks, Kerry. Um, I, we have one more question from our audience. Uh, this is from Syed Bin. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about the temperature control <laughs> test that you're running? Uh, and what properties of the gym membrane that you're measuring? Okay, so the tests that I'm particularly talking about today, we run many different tests, but uh, what's called immersion tests, where you take the gym membrane and you immerse it in the solutions you're interested in. The three primary solutions we talked about involved uh, municipal solid leachate, leachate simulated, uh, which we use as a reference. Uh, the same thing with PFAS added and DI water with the same concentration of PFAS added. We then put them in ovens at different temperatures up to 85 degrees. And we monitor the changes, particularly in the antioxidants in terms of standard OIT and HPOIT. We monitor changes in tensile properties. We monitor changes in stress crack resistance and we monitor changes in melt flow index. Those are the primary characteristics that we're looking at in assessing uh, their performance over time. We also do tests in what we call our geosynthetic long, liner longevity simulators, where we build a full scale liner system uh, with leachate on top of it. We can circulate the leachate and we can test them at a range of stresses and temperatures up to 95 degrees C, stresses in our primary cells up to one megapascal and our uh, mining related cells up to three megapascals. So a, a really a broad range of tests. I think your the simulator cells you uh, created carry really provide a, a really important set of data that allow us to draw inferences about broader lifespans and, and mechanisms that may affect lifespan over time uh, for different applications. We're out of questions and also out of time. Uh, this was, was a lot of fun. I hope the participants enjoyed it as much as I did. And I, Carrie, I wanna thank you for putting together the slides and, and uh, Kristen, for, uh, thank you for leading this for all of us. So really appreciate it. Any closing uh, comments that either of you would like to add? I have an official closing um, for the webinar. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> if there are no other comments. Um, so first, thank you, uh, Dr. Owen, Dr. Benson, for your time and, and putting this together and coordinating this really engaging presentation and discussion about such an important issue as containment systems and PFAS. Of course, I also want to thank our sponsors for this event, Geosyntech Consultants, and their commitment to continuous learning and educational development. For our listeners that are not currently members of IGS North America, you please consider joining. We're doing these webinars regularly, and they're not possible without your membership and help. Um, we provide continuing educational content, put on conferences. We do educate the educator for teaching faculty how to introduce geosynthetics into civil engineering curriculums. Lots of activity going on. And, Membership provides discounts to conferences, opens up access to two journals and international speakers and lots of other benefits. So you can go to the website, it's igs-na.org or we have a very active LinkedIn account. And if you're a student, membership is free. Um, so no reason not to join. And our next webinar is actually next week. Uh, it's gonna be Professor Michael McGuire who will be giving a presentation on vertical load transfer and sediment analysis of geosynthetic reinforced column supported embankments. I will put the link in the chat for where you can register for that. It's also on the website um, and our LinkedIn page. That's where you can find everything. And looking ahead to the rest of 2022, we have already a lot of speakers lining up. We'll release the event soon as we get the calendar together. And that concludes today's webinar. We look forward to seeing you next week, same day, same time. Thank you everyone.
Thank you.